last week I did a Instagram ask me anything in my story section. I do that from time to time on Fridays and um, I, I've tried to use the function in YouTube and it's just not as easy to, to use. So what I wanted to do is take some of those questions because there's a couple good ones that I've got asked multiple times from here and on Instagram. So I figured you guys would enjoy them as well. And so I'll be answering several questions in the video. And as typical with these videos, what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be giving you a chance to win something free. So recently I just came out with this uh, sort of 80s inspired jujitsu t-shirt. So in the video, I'm going to give you a couple different options to participate, if you will, with a comment or whatever it might be. And if I like the comment or the suggestion or whatever the feedback is, or if it gets like voted up a bunch of times, then what we'll do is I'll uh, contact you and I'll send you a free t-shirt from me to you. And so guys, with that said, let's jump into these questions that originally came from Instagram. Is it too early to get private lessons as a white belt? This is a good question. I don't think it's too early, but here's one thing I would say about private lessons. If you're going to do private lessons, I would encourage you to also do the regular classes. And most of you guys probably would. But I remember years ago, I, I had several students who would occasionally, there's a couple of these guys who wanted to just come to private lessons and then they wanted to get belted that way. They didn't want to actually come to the group classes, which I don't mind doing the private lessons, but for me, I'm not, I would never belt someone just through private lessons because I want to see that they can actually use the stuff that we're working on. My favorite private lessons personally were the ones where we would do these private lessons reoccurring and then I would like give them some things to do. So we would tweak some movements and give them some drills to do whatever. I would even count the reps with a, a notebook that I had. Um, I actually think I have the notebook over here. Yeah, this is uh, this was my private uh, lesson notebook. So there was, I would uh, have the drills listed and then I would like write down how many reps we did of those particular drills, the type of problems they were having and what we did. And then they would go in and do class. Well, then the next week they would come back to me for their private lesson or two weeks later, whatever they could uh, manage. And then we would say, okay, what happened? And we would really get down into the nitty gritty and fix it. So again, I like private lessons. They're great at any level, but make sure that you're taking that information from the private lesson and then immediately putting it into the you know, the laboratory that is rolling so you can see if it actually works. What's your favorite alcoholic drink? Most of the time, it's just basically just bourbon with some ice on it, that's it. But recently, when I was in Costa Rica, I had a Moscow Mule. Now, I'm not a big drinker, so it's the first time I ever had one. I've been drinking those a little bit, but most of the time, it's just bourbon with an ice cube or two. My drinking consumption is maybe one drink a week. That's typically, I don't drink much more than that. And what I mean by a drink, I mean like one drink, maybe with a mill or with friends or whatever. And then that's it. I don't really, I don't enjoy getting drunk or anything like that. Is it better to have a greater offense or defense in BJJ? I think it's good to have a great offense because uh, offense, if you're driving through going after the person, that offense is going to keep the other person, you know, sort of on their guard because you're coming after them. But with that, I think that one of the most important keys for developing a great offense is having a good defense early on. Because here's one of the things that I noticed when I was in jiu-jitsu. I was first coming in as a wrestler. I wanted to be dominant from top. One of the problems was is I felt completely inept on the bottom. So I couldn't do anything on the bottom. I didn't have a guard game. I didn't know how to escape. And so when it would come time to go for a submission, go for a guard pass, go for something offensive on top, I was always kind of nervous. But once I got good from the bottom and I was able to do different submissions, sweeps, things like that, and I knew that I could hang from the bottom, my top game got better because one, I knew what they were doing on the bottom, which was useful. But just as important is my mindset was such that I wasn't scared. I was able to take the risks to go for offense because anytime you go for something offensive, there's going to be some sort of movement and some space created. There's opportunities for them to counter but I wasn't worried about it. So I could really give myself, I could fully commit to the offensive weapons because I wasn't worried about what if. You can't really develop, in my eyes, a really good offense without the security and the safety net that a good defense provides. Pineapple on pizza, yes or no? No way, dude. What do you do to tackle cravings and grazing when trying to be in a calorie deficit. So this is interesting. I've cut weight a lot of different ways. and I've lost weight lots of different ways over the past 20 some odd years, right? Recently, this past year, I cut weight for a competition last year. I got the leanest I've ever been. I've never been that lean before. And I remember going through the diet. I had my diet written up from a friend of mine. And when I had the diet written up, the crazy part about it was I ate more food than I, I was eating before the diet. What it was is, is everything was intentional. So my carbohydrates were intentional, my protein was intentional, and the fats that I ate were intentional. There was no just like eat a little of this, little of that, right? And so by one, measuring my macros, my fats, proteins, and carbs, 
and eating a lot of protein and a lot of carbohydrates, I was able to fuel my workouts really well. Uh, the prote protein kept me, kept me satiated, so I wasn't hungry. And I ate just enough fat to make sure my hormone levels and everything were normal. That was the thing that was, it was useful for me as I went high protein, high carb um, with, a, with moderate amounts of fats that were used. And then I could eat that all day long. I ate like six meals a day and I'm losing weight. Granted, my activity level's high, but by measuring the food. And so not just eating whatever I want to, by eating like simple foods, one ingredient foods, rice, oats, chicken, beef, vegetables, right? Those kinds of things. I could eat a ton. And so there was no need for cravings. There was no need for grazing. I didn't eat any snacks. I ate, if I was hungry, I ate another meal because I could eat six of them a day. And for my, my sweet tooth, which I don't really have one, but I don't know what it is. As soon as I start cutting weight, I always kind of want something sweet. Was I have this protein that I get. I'll show you a video sometime. I'll, I'll, I'll make it. And I made this protein pudding. And basically, it was just this protein. You mix it with a little bit of water. It was a casein blend of protein. The protein company is actually here in Kentucky. It's delicious. And I made that stuff. And that was it. I would eat that before I went to bed at night. And I felt fantastic eating that. And I had no problem with cravings or anything like that. And I had a ton of energy for... Uh, for training. So um, I'll post more details on that. But again, if you're eating what you should be eating and you're eating like foods you actually make, you can go calorie deficit and you can still eat a lot of food and not be, not feel like you're starving. How many week or times a week do you strength train? So I strength train about mm, three to five days a week, depending on what my schedule looks like. If it's busier, about three. If it's not as busy, I can usually squeeze in five. Keep in mind, I am a meathead. I love lifting. I love lifting just for lifting's sake. I don't need to get some crazy benefit from it. There's just something therapeutic about pumping some iron that just really helps me as a person, both mentally and physically. So how do you get over motivation dips with training? Currently, I'm in the middle of my first one. Check this out, I don't do things out of motivation. What I do them out of is that I know I need to do them and so I just do them. Let's say if I need to train and I don't feel like training, I just do it because here's the magic in it. A lot of times motivation, at least for me, is more of a momentum thing. So once I get moving, I get motivated. Like for instance, this morning, I didn't really wanna lift weights. I didn't wanna get up early enough to lift weights because today's gonna be a busy day and if I didn't lift weights in the morning, I wasn't lifting. But I was like, I know what's going to happen. As soon as I get in the gym and I'm, my blood flow is going, I'm going to be good. So what did I do? I got up there in the morning, went and started lifting. By the time the lift was over, I felt amazing. And then I taught jiu-jitsu class, felt great. And so I just pushed myself through it. Now I'm motivated for the rest of the day. A good book, and I've ref referenced this one multiple times, is The War of Art. One of the best sort of pieces of this book is the idea of resistance. And to me, a lot of times when we feel those dips in motivation, I consider it resistance. Like it's like the, this, if, this force in the universe trying to tell you not to do something that you know you need to do because you just don't feel like you wanna do it, right? But as he talks about in the book, you don't feel like you wanna always get up to work, do you? But you take your lunch pail, you get up and you do it. And so a lot of times when I think about the things that I know I need to do, I think about the end result that I want, just like you do with work. You go to work because you want the money most of the time, right? If you don't like your job, of course. There could be other rewarding factors like the stuff that I do with people, but if you don't like your job, you'll still get up and go to work because you want the money. And so I think about a lot of times the things that I want from the actions that I need to take, and that's what motivates me. And once I get moving, I don't. it's, it's not so much of a motivation thing. It's just kind of, I build the motivation as I get going. And check this out, guys. As the video is going through, if there's any part of it that you wanna comment on, maybe something I say sort of strikes a chord with you, maybe you'd like to throw out your own input, I don't know, then throw your comment down below. And again, the person that either their comment sort of grabs my attention the most, or I think is funny, or if someone, if everybody likes it, there's a lots of votes going for it or something like that, whatever the comment might be, I'll, I'll contact you and we'll get a free shirt to you, one of the jujitsu shirts, kind of with the 80s theme. Why are groundhogs so elusive? So right now, which I've been posting about a little bit in my Instagram stories, I'm, uh, I'm dealing with some groundhogs. So Jess and I, we, we got a place, we got about three and a half acres out here. Recently, we've had some groundhogs. And if you lived in the country, you know that groundhogs are a problem. You don't have to live in the country to realize that. Basically, I feel like I'm getting into the like Caddyshack territory, if you've ever seen it with Bill Murray. I feel like, <laughs> I feel like I'm turning into Bill Murray, so my students are all laughing about me because every day I'll come into the gym and I'm like, Wah. I'm all flustered because they didn't take this bait or I was using this trap or whatever it is. So um, they're, they're tricky little little guys. What was your fastest submission in live competition? It was around 50 seconds and it was with a wrist lock because I'm a dirty wrist locker. What's the best quality you see in all successful students? It's hard to say like one best quality, but there is one that I think sort of 
is always present with people that really make it for a long time in this stuff or do something special with Brazilian Jiu Jitsu or really anything. That is a love for the actual practice, right? Not the, the end result, not the medals, not the attention, not the Instagram posts, any of that stuff. It's for the people that can come in and can just put their nose to the grinder and keep going, regardless of what happens. Because I've seen so many people come in over the years who I call these students shooting stars, where they come in and they're so full of enthusiasm, they're so excited, and they have these big grand expectations. And then if they meet those expectations, they realize that, well, there's still a hell of a lot more to go and it's kind of deflating because you were expecting this thing to be the special thing and then you get there and it's not so special, it's kind of just normal. Or if they don't meet their expectations, which is more often than not the case, then they sort of putter out because they feel deflated. I can look at the guy who's like after class, he's like taking all the Instagram pictures and posting every single time he trains. And then there's the guy who's over there drilling afterwards and he's just like still, his mind's still going through what he just did. That's my guy, right? That's gonna be the person that's gonna stick around because they're not worried about the gratification part of it. They're worried about the actual act of doing it. Now there's nothing, by the way, there's nothing wrong with posting a picture from time to time and stuff like that. But again, your focus has to be on the practice, not the pat on the backs not the medals, not the achievements, not the outcomes, but the actual thing that you're doing, that has to be the thing you're focused on. Advice for trying to tighten up loose skin. So brother, I don't have any advice for you. So maybe get bigger, I don't know. So check this out. I don't know how good this camera's gonna be, but so when I was a young guy, as most of you guys know, I've talked about this before on the channel, I was a big kid, I was a chunky kid. I got chunky, big. I had to go to the, the husky section in the, uh, the, the the children's clothing store, which was basically like, it's like call me a fat kid, but they wanna make it sound nice, so they call me husky. But check this out. So my biceps here, like right here, like if you look, I don't know how good this camera is gonna come through, but there's some uh, there's stretch marks, right? And you can see that like right here, even as my arms gotten bigger, right? Still, I have loose skin and on my sides and stuff like that, I still have a little bit, because when I was a big kid, my skin got stretched out and it came back in. Um, I don't know. I, I've been told different things like like creams and things like that, but I'm not your guy to ask because <laughs> I don't know. I don't care. I'm like, ah, this is just me. I am who I am. And uh, this is a kind of a reminder of who I used to be. So whatever. The biggest lesson you've learned in life. Mm, so that's, that's way too difficult to choose from, but there's one that's been on my mind and this was something I got from Jiu Jitsu, so it's pertinent to this channel. But there's one lesson that I really gained from Jiu Jitsu that like really stood out the last year. And that is that from being in a mat room, essentially, and this is with wrestling as well, since, since I was in a mat room from the time I was like 15 years old, right? I've always been around all kinds of different people because even in wrestling in high school, there was a big wide variety of people. And then I got into Jiu Jitsu and I was always around a wide variety of people. And one of the cool parts about that you don't really have the chance to be ignorant towards different types of people. And when I say the word ignorant, I don't mean mean. I mean, a lot of times that word gets used. I mean ignorant, like mean you're just not exposed to it. So you're exposed to so many different types of people that you get to see so many different walks of life, different types of views and values and all this stuff. And you get to meet people from all these different places, right? And what's cool about that is in the world we live in today where everybody's trying to separate people, and they're trying to say, well, this person's this way because they have this on their t-shirt or because they vote this direction in the ballot box that they have to be this way. You just, you, you realize that that's just not true. There's too much variety out there. You meet all these people and everybody's their own different thing. And again, I think you get what I'm saying, but I've met so many people in jujitsu where initially my first judgment on them was one way. Like there's one guy that he does a lot of work for me in the gym and he also like hell he he house sits for me when I'm gone, right? I trust this guy with with my home, right? And when he first came into the gym, I instantly thought, I was like, God, this guy's gonna be a douchebag. That's what I thought, right? And then as I got to know him, he was this interesting fellow where it's like he made some mistakes when he was younger, but man, he, he's like playing the violin and he's incredibly handy and he can just fix anything. He's just so incredibly handy. It's like this guy just never had a chance. Like he never was around a, a, a group of people that were supportive enough to give him a better view. Right? And I've met so many people like that where, again, my initial judgment was one way, but then after getting to know them, I was like, hmm, wasn't what I expected. And so it's helped me become a person where I can resist that initial judgment that I have for people and say like, I'll give you a fair shake, right? Show me who you are and uh, we'll just run with that. You know what I mean? That kind of thing. And so it's been really useful because um, 
the d divisiveness that a lot of times is created through like the media these days, it just doesn't really bother me because I'm like, I just, I, it's not true. I'm, I'm around all these people that you're talking about and we're cool. So, you know, that kind of thing. Anyway, that's one of the most important lessons that's been useful to me this past year when, uh, when I felt like the news media was at its worst. So just my thoughts, of course. So guys, that is the video. Hope you enjoyed it. Hopefully there was uh, some questions in there that maybe sort of got you thinking, gave you something to chew on, maybe an idea or two, and uh, hopefully you found it entertaining. And again, if you want to win one of the t-shirts, then put a comment down below. Doesn't have to be anything in particular. It can be a comment about something that you heard in the thing and you want to reply to. Maybe you have a suggestion that you wanted to, or maybe you want to throw out a question. I don't know. Throw something out down into the comment below. And if you do that, I will contact you with a, uh, a way to get one of the free shirts. So that's that. And I'll talk to you guys next time.